Victrix FM, brought to you by Victrix Entrepreneurs. Here's your host, single mum, entrepreneur and brain injury survivor, Michelle Williams. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Victress FM, where every week I'll be introducing you to inspiring women who have gone after their dreams and refused to give up, even in the face of extreme adversity. We'll be diving into her victories and her defeats and discovering the lessons that she's learned along the way, all with the aim of inspiring you to step into your own unique power to create a business and life that you love. Today, I was joined by the incredibly inspiring Kat Kuczynska, who is a stock market and property investor and the founder of Invested Me. Kat created Invested Me to help people and small business owners stop living from payday to payday and improve their finances by learning personal finance and investment skills. Kat spent her early years in the corporate world before starting her own business after being diagnosed with late stage cancer. And as a former promiscuous spender on the verge of bankruptcy, Kat is here to prove that anyone can rewrite their financial story and start building the financially secure life that they once dreamed of. I found this episode with Kat so moving and so inspiring and I know that you will too. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Victress FM where today I'm really delighted to welcome onto the show Kat Kuczynska. Um, Welcome so much and um, that's probably really the worst pronunciation of your name that you've ever heard but firstly thank you for joining us and secondly have I pronounced your name okay? (laughs) It's definitely not the worst I've heard so um, (laughs) well done for trying it. Uh, yeah, my, my full name is, is pronounced as Katarzyna Kuczyńska, so my parents clearly didn't intend for me to live abroad. <laughs> well, I'm glad I tried. I'm glad I came out of my comfort zone and tried it. That's all I can say. Um, but as you know, Kat, I'm just going to call you Kat from now on, if that's OK. <laughs> um, as you know, Kat, Victress FM is all about um, celebrating women's triumph over adversity because uh, I've had my own adversity in life, but I really want to inspire women that we all have the choice of how we respond to life's challenges and to decide if we want to be the victim or victress of our own lives and I'm particularly interested in exploring how sometimes the adversity that we go through takes us onto our entrepreneurial paths and I know that you've got such an amazing inspiring story of triumph over adversity so I wondered if you just don't mind you know sharing a little bit about your victory story with us today please yeah of course so um first of all i i really resonate with everything that you're doing with your podcast and i think it's a it's it's that type of stories and the type of service and um message that you're getting out there is is very very important because when we are at our lowest it really doesn't feel like there is a way out of there Mm. so um my lowest point was building up for a good couple of years before I actually hit the bottom. And I used to be in a corporate career, um, typical job where I was earning reasonably um, good money, but I didn't have any time to spend it. So I used to work 10, 12 hours a day. Um, that was the norm. The phone would be ringing in the evening and my shallow egoistic part really did think that I was the bee's knees. Um, I really was chasing this rat race and the promotions and some sort of reputation that I thought I had in the industry. Mm. And that was driving me for quite a few years. Now, all that changed a um, few days after my 26th birthday. So I remember it very well. I was sat in the doctor's office with my mum and um, we essentially got a diagnosis for me, which was stage 3B um, Hodgkin's lymphoma. At that stage, I already had three developed tumors with two more growing. Um, This is the very aggressive type of cancer. Mm. And my tumor was four inches by three inches and it was located right in my chest. So there was um, talks of potential surgery and all sorts of, you know, treatment options. And I remember it specifically 
watching my mom break apart mm. at the doctor's office. Mm. I, for me, I think at the time, it, the actual message of, oh, you've got cancer, didn't hit me as much as seeing my mum mm. um, panic at the end of the day. And she's, she's a nurse as well, so she knew exactly what the diagnosis was. Yeah. Um, and even though she doesn't speak English, um, she couldn't understand much of what the doctor said, but she definitely did understand cancer. Yeah. And I can't even remember very well the next two weeks because it was all in a little bit of the blur mm. so I was um, refusing treatment initially <laughs> I didn't want chemo I had long blonde hair and I was being told that with the type of chemo that I need there is absolutely no way of me not going bald basically mm. and I just wouldn't have it yeah. so here I here I was pretty much dying <laughs> yeah. and all what I was worried about was my hair. Were you, were you in denial do you think or did you? Um, I think that I had to create artificially a problem that was bigger mm. so I inflated this whole thing because that one thing felt like I had some sort of control over it so I think it was a little bit less of denial and a little bit more of frantically seeking something that I can actually control mm. Mm. Um, and again um, remember another visit to the consultant um, because I was basically trying to get onto the trials for different types of treatments yeah and by that point um, in the last two weeks before I was diagnosed my symptoms suddenly started popping up Mm. very very quickly um i started going downhill a lot pretty much every single day i could see my tumors growing um so by the time i sort of sat down at the office and the doctor just said look you've got to, for you to get on the trial you're looking at about two three month period time because we need to be running x amount of tests blah 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 and he was like you don't have two months wow and again just seeing my mum there it was just i think at that point i was like you know okay just just let's just do it let's just let's just go with it and i will deal with it later mm. and i guess i did um what i do actually advise for anyone <laughs> to do if they are going through cancer so four days before my first chemo i got myself a puppy <sighs> oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> i always wanted a dog um mm. but i never had time for a dog because being in the corporate world i didn't really have a life mm. um so suddenly i was like hey i've got six months off in front of me i'm getting a dog so then by the time i kind of you know get out of it um the dog will be sort of reared enough to the point of being able to go to doggy daycare and all that mm -hmm. so i got diesel um four days before my first chemo and he was my absolute rock mm. through, throughout the whole process he was this one single thing that i was getting up um out of the bed for yeah. so my parents live back in Poland so they were only sort of visiting initially they visited obviously when I was being diagnosed um, then they were just visiting every couple of months but I was living with my um, now ex-boyfriend mm -hmm. so it was just two of us and then um, my dog so that was really the my first definite low point in life mm. Well, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty low point, and I, I've got to say, when you were talking about your mum's reaction, I'm sorry, but my eyes were filling up there because <laughs> um, I I'm a mum of two boys. They're twenty, they're twenty one and um, seventeen now, mm -hmm. and I can't imagine anything worse as a mum to actually have to hear something like that. And it it also took me back because you know you know as you know I had a brain hemorrhage three years ago, and my mum had to yeah. listen to the words of 
that I, I had a bleed on the brain and I and it just made me think about oh my goodness how terrifying that must have been for my mum so that is such such a, a low point but um yeah sorry it was, thank you for being so open about that but yeah please no ab- absolutely and I think I, I loved on something that you just touched upon there is your lo- your low points in life it, it's not just about you it doesn't happen in this empty space you've got families and friends around you mm. and they are all involved and affected as well yeah yeah so absolutely. that yeah. that was definitely the case in my with my family it kind of it it, it shook everyone and, and everything especially that in my family i was the very first one to ever get cancer mm, yeah um, and it, it's it's such a terrifying word for anybody to to, to hear isn't it so yeah, yeah yeah exactly and i think as well like i just didn't expect it i was i've just turned 26 yeah so and young it, it was like how could it happen because i didn't i wasn't ever leading like really unhealthy lifestyle and all that so there was this almost like wanting some sort of an answer um, mm. I, I don't know would would I actually feel any better if I was smoking for 20 years before that happened yeah. you know I really don't know whether that would be the case but I was trying to desperately look for some sort of explanation yeah and I think you mentioned something earlier about control because I think when you have oh, yeah. uh, when you have news that something is you've got something potentially life-threatening um you feel like there's no control don't you you actually feel like that you have no control because I, w- I went from feeling literally invincible I felt um invincible and then I, I had that news delivered to me and then all mm-hmm. of a sudden I thought I became much more vulnerable I I feel but d- did you did you feel that as well that you just like you know you had a complete loss of control and that you weren't in control of your own life yeah, um, for me though, that whole process just took a longer period of time. So initially, and I would think that would be the first two months where I didn't feel like I was going to survive. Mm. Um, so the first two months of my treatment, I was busy setting up all the legals to make sure that after I'm gone, my mum and my brother get everything um and it, it's a it's a really strange exercise to actually start planning your oh. will and the division of money and actually thinking of securing the financial aspects of your family's life and mm-hmm. um, that was very quite deep process that took me through some strange ranges of emotions from being happy that at least they will have x y and z after i'm gone to thinking oh my freaking god i don't want to leave yeah yeah Um, so that was that and then when i knew that the cancer was or that that the chemo and the treatment started to work um we knew that the tumors were shrinking and there was that little bit of the space where I just felt like I'm just waiting for the chemo to be over because I painted it as some sort of special day that the minute I will walk out of the hospital I will be free and (laughs) Mm. I will have so many ideas for life and and all that Mm. Mm. and then towards the end of the treatment I was actually feeling quite hopeful so I was already counting down um, the the time, the, the, the amount of, chemo, of the chemos that I had left to do. And I was feeling like I just wanted to go to sort of all, I felt like some sort of, you know, a racehorse that is trapped, waiting mm-hmm. to just go and like burst with the explosion of life and just yeah. carry on. Yeah, yeah. And so there was, I've, almost created this massive thing out of my last chemo and then I remember the when my doctors actually told me that yeah you know you don't have cancer anymore this is it you kind of go (laughs) go out go go out live your life Mm. 
I had something that I can only describe as secondary anxiety. Um, I didn't quite have full-blown panic attacks, but I definitely was getting very, very anxious at very random times. And the way that I describe it to people is, especially when you are seriously ill, the care and NHS care is, in my opinion, fantastic when you are seriously ill. Yeah, yeah. At the GP level, it really isn't great. Um, but I had a bubble that was built around me throughout the treatment. I had the nurses and the consultants on the speed dial and we did need to use them at few occasions. Mm. And suddenly when they said, yeah, you know, you don't have cancer anymore, kind of go and go and live your life. I felt like that bubble burst. Yeah. And yeah. I really wasn't prepared for the emptiness and the confusion that I felt after. Um, yeah, I can totally I, relate. I can totally relate to that because I know after I left hospital, after I'd had, um, the coiling that I had to um, coil my aneurysm mm -hmm. and you're in hospital being cared for and then all of a sudden when you leave that care I, I had the same panic attacks because well, I, don't, I, I don't even know why but it's 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 scary isn't it because you know you haven't how, although you have got them on speed dial it's 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 terrifying isn't it yeah and I think for me looking back at it now it, I'm I now see it as that was the point at which I had to um, consciously redefine my life. There was no going back to the person that I was pre-diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I was already at that point um, not really liked the idea of coming back to the corporate career. Mm -hmm. I already saw some of the issues in my previous life i guess yeah um and it was really during the cancer where i found the whole personal development side of the world and i just feel like the whole thing with the personal development that i've done it was almost like in the movie matrix you know between the taking blue pill and the red pill. Mm. I can't remember now which pill was opening up your world, but I certainly did feel, as soon as I started digging into it, like my life was just no longer the same. It, it just, it couldn't have been the same. Mm. But then I went back into the same job. You, so, well, you, you did go into the same job after, after you- Initially, had... yes. Wow. So I was already plotting, I was already <laughs> requalifying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I very much went back into the grind of, you know, 95 and the, the soldier destroying commute. Yeah. And and I really did did actually try. I did try and give it a go, but I, I'm not a, a person that, or an employee that is good to manage. I tend to have my own ideas whether they are wrong or right it's it's irrelevant but mm. <laughs> you know mm. I'm, I'm not very very easy person to manage and yeah and I, I think after what you've been through as well you kind of like you change your priorities don't you you realize kind of what's important and life's too oh, short absolutely you don't want to yeah. waste time doing something that isn't you don't feel passionate about and uh so and i guess i guess that's kind of uh, what what happened with you yeah Absolutely. And I think that it was, I can't remember when the penny has dropped eventually, but I've realized that the life that I've built was exactly the type of life that my parents wanted for themselves. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So my parents were growing up and then had me and my brother in post-communist um, in communist, actually, Poland. Mm -hmm. I was born um, just before sort of the, the communist um, system fell, um, fell apart. But in their times, in their vision of the world, um, having a secure job, a suburban house, mm -hmm. a boyfriend and a car in the garage was all that they wanted. Mm -hmm. Now, I ticked off these things off my list very, very quickly, and I was doing it very unconsciously. Yeah. And it took 
for me to actually go through cancer to really even realize that there is another way of living life mm -hmm. and if someone is going through any type of adversity I know it's not easy thing to hear because you might these people might not be ready to hear it yeah but the same adversity that they're going through are the answers to the questions that they need answering mm. yeah i love that that's really powerful and i re definitely resonate with that mm. and i i needed that cancer for me to wake up from the the, the life that i was in if I didn't have that, I, I do actually think that it's quite possible I would be still at this job, still, you know, playing this power game with the clients and chasing some sort of arbitrary reputation and, you know, just making money for my bosses. It was just, I mean, even you should see my face right now i'm virtually cringing to myself even <laughs> thinking that i used to entertain it and i think that this is my life that mm. this is my career it, it's just i can't even comprehend it now but back then i was just a completely different person mm. so something really drastic had to happen otherwise i would just never have this kick up my bum mm. to wake up and do something different yeah yeah and how did you uh, you know how did you then go on to um you know start your own business and get to kind of where you are now um so i requalified re initially i requalified to work in the veterinary industry mm. i'm not a vet but I, I do have a huge passion for animals um dogs and horses specifically so I did a diploma that essentially would mean that I've got, um, you know, I, I had a business idea essentially. And all I wanted at that point was just to escape this, this world of, you know, corporations and mm. this job that was just sucking the life out of me at that point. Yeah. Um, so I quit um, well before I was ready, um, but I did it anyway. Um, so I quit my, um, so I started my business in January um, 2016 and then I quit my full-time job at the beginning of March. So that was when um, I just really started spending way more time with my dog and, you know, just running around creating my own my own world i guess and i really really liked it mm -hmm. um, but unsurprisingly there were some issues <laughs> because as it happened um the the world of entrepreneurial journey is always throwing you some um you know advent new adventures to take on so yeah. i was struggling um for most of my life with um, paralyzing perfectionist tendencies. Mm -hmm. So I had these, this service of these ideas that I had all my, in my head, but I just wouldn't run with them until they were perfect and mm -hmm. they were never perfect. So I was struggling a little bit in my first year of business. That mm -hmm. was paired up with some more circumstances I guess that just meant that I had another um, very very low point in my life so in the first year of business I was essentially just struggling to come to terms of I guess the new life and being able to excel in this completely changed concept of how I now work um, so in the first year of business, I lost the dog that um, was my everything throughout cancer. Um, but before I lost him, I also spent two and a half thousand pounds trying to save his life. Oh, so, failed. Yeah. Oh. Um, so I was two and a half grand less and dog less. Now, first year of business, you can imagine that that wasn't really, I didn't plan it. <laughs> I didn't yeah. have it budgets in any of the predictions um 
then one of my properties started going wrong the tenants left um the house was just left in an absolute mess and the tenant left with rent areas um so as i started fixing that we were going into the christmas period and about 10 days before christmas my house was broken into my laptop was stolen um 700 pounds of cash that i worked very very hard the previous day was stolen as well and it was just like everything just started going wrong in that first year of business so mm. then the finances were very 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 stretched yeah um so at that point i actually at some point i was carrying five different jobs part time just to make the the ends meet the, the very first property that started going wrong was just a beginning of a long <laughs> long period of problems with properties so cut the long story short but the management company that was looking after my properties and i had free at the time mm. or free buy to let plus my residential one yeah but all the free properties in the second year of my business um the tenants have left um all all houses were damaged um the management company didn't didn't bother to take any deposits from the tenants so i spent about a year and a half renovating all these houses because it got to the point where i didn't have money to pay the professionals to renovate the houses mm-hmm. i didn't have the money to sue the management company mm-hmm. and i was like i'm just stuck with it all and it did get to my second low point um, yeah. which was i was just one signature away from declaring bankruptcy wow so i um i i felt like i couldn't even sell these houses because i would lose money on them mm-hmm. um they were in terrible states um so yeah i was just sat there virtually just waiting to just sign a form send it off and just let the banks just take away the properties and just leave me alone although i know that that that, that is not what would have what 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 would have happened yeah but yeah. i had this perception that i just wanted it to stop um because of the stress now, of it all yeah oh absolutely mm. and the what i think we don't often appreciate is any big events in your life such as cancer such as you know um financial struggles they don't live on their own in this vacuum mm. there is a whole bag of emotions that we then link to these events yeah and those emotions then play up in your in your head which is almost like you know tor- torturing yourself on repeat yeah so yeah. i felt like a complete and utter failure um that i couldn't make it all work and um, that it was just too much for me to 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 jiggle around now surprisingly enough when i had all these issues with finances and with actually like paying for all my properties i was still spending money especially when i started earning it it just it would never stick yeah and just before i was about to sort of sign these bankruptcy letters and and forms i just decided that i'll give it one last shot mm-hmm. and i'll change everything about the money not only how i invest um but way more about how i earn and um, how i save how i spend and really look at every single aspect of it mm. and don't get me wrong it didn't happen overnight but things started to shift pretty quickly from then on um uh, all the houses started to being finished they were being sort of rented out again mm-hmm. um and things started looking up now by that point i was already reading all the books that i could get my hands on with regards to the actual personal finance because i was investing for many years before that 
um, I had houses for quite a few years before that as well. But I was way le- learning way more about why we do things that we do when it comes to the money. And the things that we do are certainly not rational. So um, that became almost like this obsessive passion of mine. Now, when I came out of the drama with the houses, I, by that point, my interest in self-development was was really high. It was almost, it, these two things just became the obsession in my life. Um, so I then qualified as um, a coach. I also did the NLP qualification and yeah, things just sailed on from there. So at, at, at this point, I've got a completely different business model to the one that I started um, at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And although I'm still involved in the company that I actually started uh, back in 2016, um, I'm only then consulting now and I very much um, focus on um, my own thing, which is essentially coaching and all things money. But I guess the reason why I wanted to really chat to you was none of these things would have happened if I didn't have these two hugely low points in my life. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's odd, isn't it? Because like sometimes you go through these awful things in your life and you're thinking, why me? Why is this happening to me? And sometimes you only realise when you look back on your life that maybe th- these things happen for a reason because um, you know, maybe it was to put you on this new path. Do you do you believe that? Um, yes, I do. And uh, I mean, with the first um, crisis, you know, it's not. I guess that people thought that I was taking it really well because I was positive. You know, when I was going for. Um, chemo treatments I used to joke around with the nurses that these are my vitamins and all that and that they should just spike it with a little bit of gin to just make it a little bit more bearable um so the people all thought that I was doing really well but I didn't I don't see like I had a choice mm-hmm. I had to get through it because yeah. the 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 alternative was death yeah it was the end of everything yeah. Well, with the second one, with the second crisis, um, you see, just the the money side was was one of it, and another side of it was shame and friends and families. Mm. So, my family, including my mum and my brother and my stepdad, and my boyfriend and all his family, they all believed that I should just go back to a full time job. Mm-hmm. And I know for a fact that some of them were saying things that were very unpleasant behind my back about how naive I was to still keep going with this dream of mine that I had, Mm. which I clearly was failing at. And at that point, you see, I had a choice because I could have gone back to a full-time job. I... I, I knew I had choices because I knew people that... I could virtually just ring them and I know that they would they would have taken me on straight away mm. um, and I still didn't do it mm. and I think that part of it was that whole shame that these people that were very very close to me made me feel mm-hmm. because of the circumstances that, that, that I was in actually put me on the path of no i'm going to prove you wrong Mm, yeah whatever that will take (laughs) yeah yeah i love that Um, (laughs) and you know you could argue if they were all lovey-dovey and saying all these wonderful things would the same things happen well maybe but you Mm. know what i would never turn back the clock just to see whether it would definitely happen Mm, because yeah. going through these type of um, experiences where you really feel like the closest people to you are kind of against you and they don't really have your back mm. 
you know, you do start to realize that you put way too much weight on what other people think of you. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. Deep down, I knew I was a bleeding lock rock star. <laughs> I, I always had this, I mean, call it arrogance, denial, whatever. But I always knew it deep down that I was going to achieve wonderful things. Mm. So when these people were coming into my life and their opinion was different, I was like, no, mm. <laughs> fuck it off, you know. That, It kind of really made me realize that I don't need anyone's approval to do the things that I want to do. Yeah, yeah. And I love that. Do you feel it's like intuition? Because I think that, you know, there's so many women that feel like there's more for them. But like you say, quite often get talked out of it. You you know, they'll be like, oh, Mm -hmm. why would you want to leave your secure job to do this? And, you know, I know from my own point of view, I was somebody told me when I first started my business 18 years ago, that it was the worst idea of a business I could possibly have. And it made me so determined, it, you know, so I, it, it was upsetting because it was obviously somebody that, you know, was important to me and important in yeah. my life. But those words were so powerful to me because actually it was, the mot- it was the motivation that I needed to prove that person wrong. So, um, exactly. Yeah. That, that, that was exactly what the bankruptcy did for me as well. So. It, it wasn't just that it made me improve everything to do with money. It was it was the ter- determination to really prove others wrong, um, to prove that I was right. Mm. So you, you could argue that it's quite um, it's quite a selfish thing to do. But you know what? I'm actually a fan of doing selfish things. Every <laughs> I think yeah. it's very, very underrated. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And I love it particularly because I'm a mum. So I've spent so the past 21 years always thinking of, uh, obviously, mums can never put themselves first. But I'm kind mm. of starting to do that now. And I'm loving it. So, yeah, I, I, agree, <laughs> I agree with that sentiment. But I'd, I'd like to know, how did you turn it all around, you know, from going from near bankruptcy to where you are now? Because obviously you have this amazing business where... Um, you help people to get money smart and debt free. So how did you turn it all around? Okay, so um, initially I just, I kept with quite a few jobs that I had um, to, to pay for my bills. And I just, I really had to shut down the um, things that were dragging me away from my goals. Mm-hmm. So. I spent good six months just doing the basics, making as much money as I could, um, renovating the properties and getting them rented out. Um, All three were not empty at the same time, um, but I had two empty properties and they were too damaged at, at one point. So what I had to do was I just broke it into pieces is okay the first property that needs to be sorted and rented out and all my efforts all the money um any spending stopped at that point and i was just spending as much as i could on the property to get it up and running Mm -hmm. the minute i had this one sorted we then moved on to another property and again that property was then sorted and the more i was doing the more cash I had to actually manipulate and started doing these things. Mm. I had to pay quite a lot of debts as well um, because the repairs for the houses were astronomical. So even though we were doing the work ourselves, me and my boyfriend, the cost of the materials and all that was still way more than um, I could have even imagined at that point. And very quickly, I actually realized that not only the properties are sorted and like my debts are getting paid off, but I also now started seeing this money that I now had to start investing. Yeah. So I invested quite heavily in my education. Um, I still do it to this point, um, and I actually have a budget for personal um, development and education every single year um and that budget keep grow keeps growing as well year on year mm-hmm. and 
um, started investing way more with my newly found knowledge and it was just new sort of these new skills that I had so I just dragged my investments that I had in the previous funds um, that I had them with and I just really started playing with it a little bit experiment a little bit and actually find that not only I, I actually find it quite simple the very very basics are simple everyone can do it and um, I was actually really enjoying it and then when I started then working as a as a coach and I started getting clients, I just had people coming on to me for advice on like how to get out of debt and you know how to even start thinking about setting up their early retirements. Um, or you know I had huge amount of like entrepreneurs that are like, well, I want financial freedom. You know, this is what I want my business to create so I can then spend more time, you know, doing whatever, giving my skills or spending some more time with my family, whatever. But they didn't actually know how to do it. Yeah. So can, I, can I just ask them, when you first started out as a coach, was that not initially as a wealth coach then? No, no. So you started out what sort of as like a life life coach and then you realised yeah. that, that what people needed was wealth coaching. This is what I was being led to. Led to essentially. Yeah. So it wasn't something that I um, planned on doing. It just it just happened. And then I kind of realized that it's that type of work that I actually really enjoy because I can put the two of them together. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, you know, I've still got some some coaching clients um, that you know i'm not trying to get them to retire in 10 years time <laughs> but um at the same time this is really what i started leading with if you like that this mm. is one of my my biggest passion and yeah it's just it, this is essentially how it all happened it kind of evolved quite yeah. naturally yeah so um so yeah that that's what i'm doing now yeah and i love that because i think that you know it's it kind of you have to listen to what the market's asking for and and also i i feel like you know whether you're religious or you believe in the universe i think sometimes the universe gives us clues and it seems to me like you were given those those clues really and 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 it's led you down this path of of helping people to get sort of money smart and debt free which obviously is, yeah. is so so important but you've mentioned quite a few times about how important um personal personal development is and how you became interested in personal development when you were um you know when you were ill uh, with cancer and going through your treatment so kind of what put you know what put you on that sort of personal development journey and how did you find out about it and get interested in it because I've spoken to so many female entrepreneurs that mm -hmm. have had no idea about personal development and the importance of mindset and have only discovered it later on in their life so mm -hmm. what put you on that path? Um, okay so I um, I was always a very obsessive mind. mind. Um, my default is to obsess over things um, perfectionist tendencies and all that and I was just finding myself very very unhappy mm. even though um, the life outside of me was seemingly okay and I was trying to find answers to that because I couldn't for me it was like is 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 this it is this what this thing called life is yeah um and I couldn't even tell you how it started. I can't actually. It started with the book called Tools. I can't remember the authors now because I haven't read it in years. Okay. Um, oh, tools as in T-O-O-L-S? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I know that there are two authors. I think Phil, someone, and the other name, it just it won't come back to me right now. And that was, I think, the first book that I read and I was like, oh, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. They were talking about the type of things that for me at the time seemed quite woo-woo, but it all, it all made sense. Mm. And 
it, I think it just started from then on. You know, the internet is a wonderful place when you've got an itch that needs scratching and you're yeah. just looking for a thing that is going to scratch it. Yeah. Um, so then the more books I, I read, the, the more interested in the whole subject I am to the point where, you know, nowadays I don't actually read fiction anymore at all. Mm. Um, I'm a huge bookworm. Um, I love learning and self-development, sort of mastering your own monkey brain and personal finance, behavioral economics. This is all that I read about. And yeah, it's just, I can't even tell you how important just finding that first book was. Yeah. Because this, this first book, it didn't solve any of, any of my problems. Mm. But I think what it gave me was hope for finding explanation as to why I was so miserable in my existence when I was supposed to be happy. Mm, yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, I, my first book, because we've all got one, haven't we? My first personal development book was actually Napoleon Hill, um, Think and Grow Rich. Oh, and, yeah. what a book! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and that kind of started my personal development journey. Um, mm -hmm. And if I ever had a low moment or a moment of self-doubt, um, I would actually go out for a run and I'd have it on Audible and I'd actually listen to it and it would yeah. automatically put me back um, in the in the right mindset. Um, and I think it's so, so powerful. And I think particularly, you know, if you, if you are going through adversity or if you feel that your life is off balance, or if you feel like you haven't got control, because there's, you know, certainly times mm -hmm. you feel like we've got control. It's so powerful, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think that, that there is, I wish that there was something, a, a magic word that I could say to people that are right now in their deepest, shittiest moment that they think that they can't be that where they feel like their life just can't get any worse because I wish that there was some magic word that I could say look in three four five six months time you will look back at this moment and think thank god you thank universe you know whatever it is that you believe in it happened mm. because without it I perhaps wouldn't get where I am now yeah. so I think the best maybe piece of advice that we could give is that we all go through the periods of time where we do feel like the giving up and just letting go of your dreams is the only way forward mm. but it really isn't and any adversity that you are going through has got a key to unlocking the next level of success mm. Yeah, yeah, because I think there's they're always seeing it, certainly in some of the adversity that I've been through, there's always always been lessons in there somewhere. Yeah. Um, that have like helped me. I haven't seen them Absolutely. at the time necessarily. Um sometimes it's only when you look back, but yeah, you, mm -hmm. you feel do you feel like that as well? Yeah, oh absolutely. There is there is this saying that I, I absolutely love. The where you are now is essentially where you've got the skills. Because if you've got the skills to take you further, you would be further already. Mm. So the reason why you're struggling with some sort of adversity is because there is something that you need to learn about it to go to a next stage. Mm. Now I'm not saying that if you've got cancer, then you know you need to learn about something. But there are people that get cancer and they still go on with their lives and, um, you know, they get better. And there are people that give up just because they've got cancer. So it's not about the circumstances, it's about how you can leverage them to give you the best outcome for the future. Mm, yeah, definitely. I love that. And I mean, from all of the adversity that you have been through, because obviously you've been through so much and, you know, I don't know, what's your, because you, obviously you're cancer, you're only 26. Do you mind me asking how old you are now? Um, I am now um, 32. Yeah, so still young. Well, I can say that because I'm, I'm, yeah. sort of, I'm, <laughs> I'm 50. So to me, that's, that is young. So you've gone through a lot of adversity in, you know, such 
a young age. So what if you if you could give yourself a really good piece of, of advice about all of that adversity that you've been through? Mm-hmm. I normally say give your younger self a really good piece of advice, but from my point of view, you are young. But let's say if you could give your younger self a really good piece of advice, what would it be? Um, do everything earlier. Yeah. So um, quit the job earlier. Um, go to the doctors earlier. <laughs> yeah. um, get the dog earlier. Um, do this presentation that I was absolutely terrified of giving earlier mm. and fail earlier. So we, this is this is just my observation, but it's certainly featured in my life very heavily in the past, is I would just wait with everything. I would wait for the right moment. I would wait for this, this, this thing that would just arrive and make my life better. And yeah. it, it, the, the moment is never going to be perfect. Mm. The mm. more, the more failures almost you can get, the quicker you are going to start blooming into the person and the personality that you know deep down you have the potential to be. Mm. I, so, I, I, I I love that. I really do. I love that. But, but instead, what we are doing is um, we don't want to do certain things because they are uncomfortable. So we are holding off for the right moment. We are holding off until we are the better person and that moment never arrives. No, because actually to become the better person, we need to go through a few failures and a few mm-hmm. lessons, don't we, to evolve yeah. and grow into that person, which I think, you know, it's, it's, it's all of us naturally want to stay within our comfort zone, but exactly. that is not how we grow as a person and reach yeah. our true potential. And I think by coming oh, out of your it. comfort zone, that is really where we discover who we are and also gives us that real sense of purpose because I think that in life we're looking for a real sense of fulfillment and we can only do that ourselves by really becoming the person that we have the potential to be do you agree with that oh absolutely um yes everything to what you said that is (laughs) exactly what I eventually came to realization yeah and you've mentioned a bit about perfectionism as well about sometimes you you waited or you didn't do something because uh, of perfectionism and there is a quote um about perfection oh perfect sorry my my earphones came off there but there's a quote about perfectionism actually being the enemy of progress and i think that's so true do you think oh yes Oh, it, it stops you in your track because before you even produced anything or created anything, you've already shut down the whole idea um, and the concept that it might actually work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's another there's another saying as well, something like something like um, start start now where you are with what you've got as well, which I really love. Yes, yeah, and like you know, looking back at my like you know corporate job. I was frustrated with it before I had cancer, Mm. but that frustration just wasn't strong enough for me to just leave the job. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, You know, if if you are, if you are on a on a you know little bit more into the the woo woo stuff, you could argue, did I end up with having cancer because of all this ongoing stress and Mm. progress on the immune system? Would I still end up with cancer if I quit the job two years beforehand? Mm. Or would the universal powers decide that actually I didn't need to get it because, yeah, I, I was already, I already did what I was supposed to do. Mm. Yeah. And I've got, I've got some friends that are really very much into the woo woo stuff, and we had some wonderful discussions about it. The, the truth is, is, is I have no idea whether whether that was it or not. But it was just an interesting interesting concept. Mm. But uh, I think I think that I think the thing is though, and this show is all about sort of identifying what a victress is. And a victress is a woman who is victorious. And for what you've gone through and what you've gone on to achieve, you are definitely the defi- definition of a victress. But what do you what do you think makes a victress? You know, why? Because somebody that's gone through what you've been through could have so easily crumbled or mm-hmm. taken the easy route 
So what what do you think has made you different? Um, you know, what what do you think those things are? Um, the the one quality that kept popping up was just the sheer determination. Mm. There was, I haven't given myself an option to fail. Yeah. So quitting was never an option that I was seriously considering. Mm. It was there. It was it was right next to me. It was quite easy actually at the time. Um, you know, getting in in terms of the bankruptcy, you know, getting a job that was that was quite easy. Yeah. It's just I wouldn't even entertain it. Yeah, exactly. And I think that would have been the easy option, wouldn't it, to just go back to your corporate job? Yeah, you have to be determined to want the type of life that you envisage. Yeah. And don't ever let go of that, no matter whether your husband, boyfriend, partner is telling you otherwise. It doesn't matter. All what matters is this very, very quiet voice in your head that is telling you that you can do more and your life can be more than it is now. It's yeah. there for a reason. Yeah, it's it's your intuition, isn't it? And we, yes. need to, we need to follow it. But, you know, you talk about having a, very, a clear vision as well. So do you, do you have any particular personal development, daily rituals or routines that you use to keep you focused on your goals and sort of uh, focused on success? So um, I have a few. Um, I do meditate, um, I do quite a lot of visualization or I do both actually. So I almost mix them together. And the reason why I do meditation and mindfulness is because it is something that I struggled with for such a long time. But the effects that I see on my brain are beyond belief so I, c- I can't ignore that even though I still find it difficult to shut my brain mm. <laughs> yeah your brain's um, too busy you mean yes yeah. yeah I like to I don't I don't easily switch off once I open a, a thought yeah I need to box it off before I can um, relax and if mm-hmm. I don't box it off then yeah I'm just non-existent basically so yeah. Um, my boyfriend could be talking to me, but if I've got something that I haven't quite processed in my mind, I'm, like, there is nobody at reception. I yeah. might be there, <laughs> like I'm listening, but I really am. <laughs> like, I'm yeah. really not. Yeah, um, I, I, I relate to that. <laughs> so yeah. meditation, mindfulness. I think for me, the, the big part of it is just um, having my dog. Obviously, um, the boy that I had when I had cancer is no longer with us mm-hmm. but I do have um, another dog of the same breed um, she's a little girl and I walk her every single day um, I sometimes listen to podcasts um, audiobooks but I think for me just that that exercise every single day mm-hmm. going back to the very very basics is something that I personally just love yeah. and another third one which is um, not actually unusual, but it's not comfortable. And these are cold showers in the morning. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So there is the theory that you can trick your brain into liking it. (laughs) And I love the cold showers in the morning. Mm. I will put some really upbeat music um, so the cold showers 30 seconds of warm water just to open all the capillaries and then two and a half minutes of cold cold water it's very good for your skin mm-hmm. but it also really wakes you up for the day yeah and I can imagine <laughs> I hate the cold mm. um, if I'm cold I am really really grumpy mm. but the cold shower is just it's not just the energy you feel like such an endorphin rush afterwards and i think what will be quite in what is for me quite interesting is today well you're on when i was doing it i was dancing in the bath basically (laughs) with this 
really upbeat music with freezing water all over me and I was thinking oh my god this is so much fun but were you dancing because the music was good or because the water was so cold <laughs> um, I was actually dancing because the music was so cool oh, it was wow. so good but actually the water was still there but you can trick your brain because the brain is just is more focused on the music and the movement of dancing rather than on the cold water mm, yeah now so where did you get sorry i was gonna i was gonna say as well where did you get this idea from of the cold showers <laughs> um there is a guy um in netherlands and he is called wim hof he's called the ice man okay if you want um some really um almost like supernatural things to read about read about him this is the guy that is defying what we know about autonomic nervous system. He can survive in the ice where a normal person would be going way into hypothermia like ages before and mm. this guy is still okay and he essentially managed to get there just with the power of his mind to the point where the neuroscientists that are actually studying him are now saying that it is actually possible that we can influence autonomic nervous system. Oh wow. Now autonomic nervous system is the one that is automatic that the science previously was telling us that you can't control. Well this guy is bending that reality um, and this is how he starts his day. Um, Tony Robbins starts his day with cold showers as well. Wow. Um, and it's just it's an incredible thing to do because i think what it also gives you is a glimmer of hope because if your brain can think that being shower like you know having freezing water all over you is fun mm -hmm. then speaking in public you mm. can definitely reframe that mm. you know whatever it is that you're struggling with yeah. you can change that you just yeah. need to find a way to hack into your mind yeah, I love that. It's uh, it's those neural pathways, isn't it? And mm -hmm. like, yeah, changing the, those messages. So oh, I love that. And you've mentioned about walking as well. And I think we've got so much in common because you're obviously a dog lover, so am I. And <laughs> um, uh, I'm gonna have to see if you've got your dog on Instagram because I, I'll definitely, <laughs> I've got my, my dog, my dog Daisy is all over my Instagram page. And, and that's, that's one of my rituals is I, I wake up every morning and I make sure that I go on a, a three mile walk with her um, mm -hmm. and I think it's so good for you. You need that space for your mind, don't you as well? But I think also we're in such busy online worlds that you need to have that time out to be away from screens and just go back to the real world really, don't we? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I can't... Uh... I can't even imagine my world without dogs in it. They are just such a huge part of it. And, you know, I, I try and ride as much as I can as well, although right now I don't have my own horse. Um, and being with animals, this is the best therapy that I could wish for. And I just, I wish that it was a bit more out there. <laughs> But yeah we, we need to be making the most of the very very simple stuff the, yeah. these this is these are the experiences that are actually keeping us sane yeah absolutely and when you were talking about your you know that you got your puppy and and that your you know your your puppy you know you he was what you were getting up for in the morning and that he was the mm. best therapy for you again i completely relate to it because my you know my dog daisy was the same when i um when i came out of hospital um they're just so good for our, our health and well-being definitely but um i could talk to you all day can i honestly could and i'm going to definitely connect with you more uh, once we get off of this podcast because i found what you said i would love that yeah so so fascinating so inspirational to know what you've uh you know what you've been through what you've overcome and i'm certainly inspired by your story so i know that all of our um listeners will be as well but before we close off i just wanted to ask you know 
if um, any of our listeners want to find out more about you or connect with you um, and also get some help from you because I know that you've got a couple of free gifts for um, our, the listeners of Victorious FM you've got your um, you've got your budgeting tool and also your free mini course so can you talk us through um, that, those things as well before we close off please yeah, so um, the budget assistant is the tool that I actually use to control my cash flow. And that is a very, very simple tool that makes budgeting simple and fun. So we've been sold this idea that budgeting is just so boring and it means tightening the belt and so on and so forth. But it really isn't. So I've designed the budget assistant so that it's very very simple and it takes no time at all it takes about 10 15 minutes to set up and then about a minute every day maybe two minutes if you're spending a lot of money to then maintain and if you start using it i can guarantee you that you will have more money at the end of the month or mm -hmm. you will have more money left at the end of the month mm -hmm. so that's the budget assistant and then the debt free blueprint it's the seven steps and seven strategies that I used to get out of multiple five digit debts. Um, and this was the free challenge that I ran in my group um, with some really wonderful results pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So what I then did is I just combined it into a mini course that people can take um, and that's all free of charge. Of charge. Ah, oh, that's amazing. And what better person to teach about this sort of stuff that, you know, than somebody that's actually been through it and got themselves out of it. So I, it's so amazing and so inspiring. So that's great. I'm going to make sure that we include links to those um, in the show notes and also over on the website. But um, how, in which other ways can people connect with you as well? So um, I am on Instagram and Facebook and Pinterest. Um, I'm not on Twitter. I just I can't quite deliver myself in 140 characters. Um, <laughs> so um, it's just um, Facebook.com invested me. I am I'm on Instagram and they invested me as well, and on Pinterest and they invested me. Now, um, for the coaching side, it's just invested me coaching, and that's that. That's where you can get where, where you can get me. And um, if you've got any questions or any stories that you want to share, then please do reach out. Um, I do answer all the emails and all the messages, um, regardless whether they are to work with me or whether it's just to share a story um, or ask some questions. So please feel feel free. Oh, thank you so much for that. And once again, thank you so much for being on the show. I've absolutely loved talking to you. I could carry on for another hour quite easily. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, I just value the time that you spent with me and definitely would love to connect with you after the show. But thank you and goodbye for now. And uh, once again, thank you for joining me, Kat. Thank you for having me. You will speak soon. Bye bye for now. And to you, our wonderful Victorious FM listeners, I hope that you've enjoyed this interview as much as I have. Don't forget, if you want to find out more about Kat, please either check out the show notes or head over to victoriousentrepreneurs.com where all of our podcast guests are featured on our website. Please also check out all of our amazing free resources to help you through each stage of starting, launching and growing your own business. And please don't forget to subscribe to Victorious FM on iTunes or Stitcher to make sure that you don't miss out on another inspiring episode. But until next week, stay victorious. You're listening to Victorious FM. Victorious Entrepreneurs, for women who are victorious in business and in life.